Hello, I'm Dr. Monica Kraft, System Chair of the Department of Medicine at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. And we're here in Aspen, Colorado, and I'm talking to you, Dr. Elisa Port, about breast cancer. Dr. Port, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Dr. Lisa Port. I'm the Chief of Breast Surgery for the Mount Sinai Health System and the Director of the Dubin Breast Center. Thrilled to be here. It's great to be with you. So I think I'll start out to ask you, what are some important advances in detecting and treating breast cancer? Sure. So um, the reason why we have so many reasons for optimism, Monica, in now 2023 is because there's been so much progress made on both the diagnostic, early detection, and on um, early diagnosis fronts, as well as options for treatment for those who are not detected as early. Um, on the diagnostic side, um, we've gone in less than 20 years from film screen mammogram to digital, now to 3D. And we, we actually were the first ones at Mount Sinai in New York City to get this new, better technology 3D mammography does better in diagnosing breast cancers earlier, less callbacks, so a lot of benefits. Um, you know, we also know better can just screen now for high-risk surveillance. We frequently add on ultrasounds and MRIs when they're worried that a mammogram is going to miss something. Mammograms are great, but like all tests, they're not perfect. And so we do want to supplement in people that, that we're concerned about. Absolutely. No, it's actually really, really an exciting time to be in the field. Uh, and so another area that's exploded in force is in genetics in all fields. We have an increased understanding, breast cancer is no exception. So can you tell us a little bit about how genetic testing is really advanced detection? Sure. I mean, obviously this is a huge impact on their breast cancer patients. So back in 1994 and 95, two of the first cancer predisposition genes ever identified were called BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, these genes were identified in families that had a huge amount of breast to ovarian cancer. We were able to identify these genes and now test people, both um, women in families at high risk and also those diagnosed from breast cancer to tell us what was causing that breast cancer. And the advancement of genetic testing was definitely continuing. For a long time, we didn't identify any other genes. And then starting in 2013, a whole flurry of other breast cancer predisposition genes were identified. These have funny names like CHECK2, ATM, PALB2. But now when a woman comes in diagnosed with breast cancer, or even if she just has a strong family history and, and wants to know if she has one of these genes, we don't test for just one or two genes. We test for a whole pal of genes and knowledge is power. You know, women do get nervous about genetic testing. A lot of people who say, oh gosh, then I'm gonna have to do something drastic or um, I'm not ready for the information. But um, no one forces anyone to do anything. And it really is important information and you can really at the very least know who's at highest risk and screen them in a much more effective way so that if God forbid they do develop breast cancer, we do have the best chance of picking it up the right and absolutely. And so that said, do you think that women who are at high risk, say by family history, um, should actually undergo genetic testing? Sure. Or they so, with you? Yeah, so I, I think that, um, you know, again, there's no one size fits all. Um, we can't, breast surgeons can't test everyone because um, women with family histories often only see a surgeon when they first have a problem or need a biopsy. So yes, we want to be more collective about this and have our primary care providers, our GYNs, our frontline caregivers able to identify people, red flags of where they might be at risk for harboring one of these genes and where testing can provide a lot of information. Absolutely. And so I would guess also some education continually is needed because you all advances with our primary care colleagues, sure, UYN physicians to make sure right. they're doing the really the state of the art care. Yeah. And, right. and it's not easy because um, the criteria for genetic testing are um, constantly evolving. Sure. There was actually a change earlier this year in 2023. It used to be that. Um, so if you were diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 35, you were eligible for genetic testing regardless of your family history. Um, 
that line in the sand moved this year to 50. So casting a wider net. So now anyone who comes in under the age of 50, which is much more inclusive than anyone you buy. Absolutely. Uh, it's hard for primary care doctors and people to keep up with these constantly changing recommendations, but we do need to cast a wider net and get more people in for testing. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think as genetics becomes more and more part of medical practice, I think our primary care providers can be more comfortable with it. That's your good news. We can see that for sure. And have. I know you have to. Absolutely. So about detecting breast cancer, I know you mentioned something about um, uh, ultrasound and other ways of early detection. Can you oh, take a little bit deeper dive on that? Sure. So, um, you know, mammograms are definitely a standard of care for getting for, for early detection. It's the only test that has been shown time and time again, we have data for now more than 50 years, showing that mammograms do save the lives and they save lives by picking up cancer earlier. Um, but like all tests, uh, mammograms aren't perfect. There is no perfect medicine. We think mammograms pick up about 85 to 90% of cancers, but that means there are 10 to 15% that are going undetected in an early way. And our job has been to try and figure out if we can better uh, identify women who are at higher risk for developing a breast cancer that might not be seen on the out of so we could proactively screen them and fill in the gaps with these other modalities as your son and I. Um, women with dense breasts. For bring that up. Absolutely. Now yeah. also sounds recommended. Right. right. So a big deal was a few months ago, um, the FDA actually stepped in. So there were laws in various states requiring notification of either a patient or her provider. Mm -hmm. If on the mammogram she had dense breast, mm -hmm. and that maybe she was at risk for a cancer myeloma detected, and maybe ultrasound or MRI should be considered. Well, those laws, which were quite variable from state to state, um, and there were many states that didn't have those laws, uh, sometimes you notified the patient, sometimes you notified the provider. Flash forward to a few months ago where national now recommendations, guidelines, requirements were made uh, by the FDA that all breast imaging facilities now need to notify the patient by placing a paragraph of text in her mammogram mm -hmm. that she will receive about her breast density. And that's really a step forward, again, like in keeping with the theme that knowledge is power. Um, you do want patients to know about their bodies, women know about themselves. Yes. It's not an obligation to do additional testing, but it certainly is an addition. Absolutely. And that, that's exciting because I think, I know New York State has it. Yeah, uh, and we wrote to that the first. Connecticut, I believe, was the first. We were one of the first. It got up to about 38 states okay. before um, the FDA stepped in. Good. So there are definitely a few still missing. Got it. And then as far as MRI goes, we typically reserve that for women who are at the highest risk of getting a breast cancer. Um, there are a lot of false positives with MRI, meaning we find things uh, and they stand up and just call so much. Just, and so we don't want to put a lot of women through unnecessary testing if it could be a buggy. So we generally really keep MRI testing for our highest risk patients, particularly like a blocking mutation. Sure, it absolutely makes sense. So um, I know that the treatment of breast cancer has really changed over the years, certainly from the days I was in training. And, and so could you um, expound on some of the most promising chairs we have right now? Um, I think what, what people need to understand is that, um, you know, there's no one size fits all. And some of what we've been doing in the last 30 years is really personalizing and curating care for the individual. Um, you know, it used to be, for example, there was a, a one anti-hormonal ACAN. When I started 20 years ago, and it feels like a very long time, but um, it's not that long in the history of science. And, and 20 years ago, there really was only one anti-hormonal agent available and it was a one size fits all and everyone got it. It was called Tomas. Years later, a new class of drugs developed 
And these are much more effectively post-mitocausal bourbon than tamoxifen. The Calderon that tastes bitters. And guess what? There's more than one. And they each have a slightly different benefit and side effect profile. So our medical oncologists now have a whole cadre of medications for which choose a customized and tailor based on the person, their concern of side effects, and a variety of other conditions. On the chemotherapy front, of course, you or if ever treat in options than ever before. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that between the year 2000 and 2010, the death rate from breast cadence when it dropped 2% each year. So if a person was diagnosed after 2010, they're 20% more likely to survive the disease than just a decade earlier. That's impressive. And that trend continues strongly so that we are at unprecedented survival rates and ergo the incredible and legitimate reasons for optimism. So thinking of all the options, it could be a little daunting. I would think for a provider, for an oncologist, for a general pr provider, for the patient. Sure. So how do you think the philosophy of treatment has changed compared to what it was in the past. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you bring up an excellent point that I never get tired of talking about, which is, um, you know, the thing that really, oh, it confounded me was that as breast cancer survival rates are moving up and up and up over the last two decades that I've been involved in treating patients, what I started seeing, which was very, very concerning, was more doom and gloom and more pessimism patients coming into the office than ever before. And I couldn't understand why that was happening when our results were better than ever, our options were better than ever. Um, we're diagnosing people early with these astounding survival rates, 90%, 98% for, for different interventions. And, and what I figured out to be true for my practice and my patients was the big game changer was really um, the age of information and the explosion of information. Um, when a woman's diagnosed with breast cancer, everyone tells her, get information, get information. Well, the problem is not lack of information anymore. It's actually too much information and no filter. And so what was happening is I was starting to see women who were very, um, had excellent prognoses. Um, they'd be diagnosed with breast cancer and it would be a week or two into late see a doctor to discuss their particular case. And in that interval, uh, there was a lot of going online, a lot of Dr. Brulee, a lot of that. And the internet was selecting out more doom and gloom type scenarios. You know, all of my patients who do really, really well, do not go back on the internet to talk about how well they're doing. So the internet kind of selects out for the worst case scenarios and the doom and gloom and desperation even. And so my new diagnosed patients were going online and seeing a selected cohort of patients that generally had bad outcomes and that led them to very dark places. No one's going to tell a person, don't go to the internet, do go to the internet. What we can do though, is give them a little bit of a toolbox for understanding that if you do dare to go off, understand, be there, be aware, and be a little insulated from these worst case scenarios and just don't go there. Um, you know, women who are newly diagnosed have every reason to be optimistic. Be easy. And so uh, we, we want to, we want to inform them and, and make sure they understand exactly. Well, I think the internet can be scary because I think if you do go down one negative path, sometimes the internet will profile you, yeah. continue that path. Yeah. I've seen that happen in other areas. It was short. Sure. You can see where the, the information can become really negative when yeah. it isn't. And it's really that interval, Monica, between diagnosis and when you first get in to see a doctor. It could be a week or 10 days where you get no viable or valid um, you don't have a player, right? And so um, it leaves people in a very vulnerable state. Absolutely. Those are, those are really, really important words. I think something to remember because I know a lot of my patients get on the internet immediately too and bring me things that yes. uh, aren't true. And, yeah. uh, and so it's really important to be, help them manage all that information. It's valid for every medical condition. Exactly. For sure. Exactly. 
So saying that, just to, is there anything else you'd want people to know about the science or innovation in women's health, given that we are at such a, a wonderful time yeah. in, uh, in our history? What, what I would really like people to know is that, you know, I think this is, you know, especially after COVID, there's a huge amount of misinformation out there. We've talked about that a little bit, but there's also a lot of skepticism about science, about innovation, about pushing people into treatments or various uh, interventions that they may or may not be. And that doctors are, you know, even conspiracy theories, that doctors are benefiting off of all of this going on and unwellness. And wh what I would like to say is that at least in breast cancer, one of the biggest thrusts of research that I am the most proud of is doctors are leading the charge to figure out how we can actually scale back on treatments and deliver the same excellent results. So doctors, surgeons led the charge for lumpectomy, a smaller surgery over mastectomy. Doctors led the charge trying to figure out how we don't have to remove all the lymph nodes into the arm, maybe just a few, very big out of view. Um, there's new trials going on now that surgeons are leaving to determine if after certain kinds of treatment, if the cancer completely melts away, do they even need surgery now? Um, the same is going on with radiation. We now know it used to be everyone got radiation after a white had to be. Now we've scaled that back to natically care and done a really good job of identifying subsets of patients who may not need radiation and do just fine. Because of the research of one of our Mount Sinai colleagues now, Joe Sperano, who led a groundbreaking trial called the Taylor RX trial, um, we are now giving 30% less chemotherapy to patients than we were 10 years ago. And that science and the doctors are leading the charge towards scale exact that care. So I'm really proud of that. I think we all should be. It's going on on multiple fronts. And I think I, I really would love the public to hear that, that we are, you know, we, we would love to take early retirement and live in a place like Aspen and have breast cancer and asthma and all these other terrible things that affect the people insured and have us have nothing to do. We'd love that. Absolutely. Well, your words are very wise, incredibly informative. You've been really wonderful hearing your thoughts. So thank you, Dr. Park. Thank you for joining us in Aspen, Colorado. Now talk about innovation in breast cancer. <laughs>